session we will focus a little bit more on assessment. How is it that we're going to evaluate the students after having gone through or during and before uh, this experience that ties up in an integrated organic way with their learning outcomes. Okay, okay so we assess the experience and we assess the learning. The experience, we harvest that service experience through the reflection tool. Okay, and again I will have a few slides on reflection. But it helps you understand before the experience what students are going through, the kinds of assumptions they have, the stereotypes that they are not aware of but that they, they have, okay? Uh, the kind of language that they're using, the kinds of expectations they have, the behaviors that they're not aware of. So the reflection part at the beginning serves that purpose. And then you bring in other reflection during, at any point that you like, and in any form, and we'll talk about when and in what form, and then reflection at the end. And it's not an end, it's a cycle. Okay, it's not a linear thing, it's a cycle. So they go through an experience, they reflect at the end of that, but then they can go back to a new experience with this newer growth that they've developed. Um, I learned, for example, from one of my students uh, when I did an initial reflection before going into the um, community, <coughs> okay, it, it was that Sudanese uh, oral narratives experience. And one of the students wrote in her reflection that this is not a project that I can handle. I cannot do this. Okay? I cannot handle the emotional stress and the trauma, uh, the, the listening to stories of trauma. I cannot handle it. So I, I called her. You know, I said, come, let's talk. What's your fee? Okay? And she said, I can't, I can't spend the semester listening to stories of horror. And I said, maybe they're not stories of horror. We're trying to see the human being. We're trying to see the similarity. We don't need to focus on the trauma. We can focus on the dreams. We can focus on the family, you know. And she said, I, ca I can't. I will, not, I will not do this assignment. Okay? What do you do in a situation like that? So you have a class of 16 people, 15 people are going to be doing a, a project that is in my writing for publication class, they're going through a process that will lead to publication, okay, and they're doing it through a community-based learning experience and one person will not. What do you do? You should take the other side, for example, <coughs> talk to uh, Egyptians or talk to... Uh, for example, an authority and see what do they think about that? Okay. So what good? What happened was I, I did exactly what you're doing. I started thinking, what is it that I want to achieve? And what I want to achieve is the course learning outcomes, which say students need to go through the publication process. It doesn't have to be through this particular assignment. So what I said was, okay, if it makes you happier to find another community okay and to communicate their voice through an article you can write an article working with uh, somebody from a particular community that is you know underprivileged more invisible and bring out their voice and commu and publish it so that people can hear about it can i just finish the uh, point so what she did was over a weekend, she went to the Sinai, she spent uh, some time in the hills with the Bedouins, and she came and she said, you know, I, I have friends in the Bedouin community, and I want to communicate the story of one of them in the first person, and I will write an article and publish it. I said, do. That's what she worked on all through semester. And I still gave her feedback, and I worked with her to fulfill the course learning outcomes, but she was not stuck with the particular project that I had chosen for the class. It just made her feel more at ease and she broke this barrier and 
uh, fulfilled the learning outcomes, but she also learned a great deal through the discussions in class and the students telling their stories of what they were doing with the Sudanese refugees. And, and then a year after that semester finished, that student sent me an email which made me cry. And she said, can you help me write a book proposal? Because I've collected a whole, you know, I've collected a number of stories and I want to publish a book a collection of stories on the Bedouins in the Sinai. She, she's fulfilled the learning. And she's taking it to that other level that we've tried with the other students. But it's a different experience for her. And I think by the end of the semester she was more eager to kind of, she felt more at ease with the, with the community that she initially felt, I, I can't, I'm emotionally traumatized by this. She, she got over that barrier. Amen. It was, so, it was the shift from writing in the first person rather than about? That's what made it? No, the ser you're asking about what is the service. Mm -hmm. The service is that we made the voices of these people heard. heard. Okay? In the by using so I instead of No, a. by by publishing the stories to a readership that wouldn't normally learn about their individual stories. The other thing is the royalties that come out of this book, which is a Kalem. Mm. <laughs> the royalties go back to Amira, the organization we initially started working with, to help them support uh, refugees. They were written in English and we spoke about that. So there is a particular community reading about the, com the refugee experience, but it would have been a wonderful other activity for another maybe translation class to translate the book and communicate and publish that. Okay, and that would have been another community-based learning activity in a different uh, class. Yeah. I just want to say about the royalties, that they're not really important. What matters is the publishing will give you more uh, grants based on what you've done. So if you publish something that becomes more physical, it's more uh, accomplished. That, that's a proof that you can carry on a full project. So yeah. that what, what really helps yeah. Amira as an example, not from the money they're going to make from the book. Yes. And, but also, I mean, in, in terms of the learning, of course, the, the students learned about the publishing experience, the publishing process, and they wrote. Okay, they wrote for publication, and they wrote a book proposal, and they communicated with the publisher. And the service, really, was that all of these, there's a wide audience that's reading these stories, and it's making change in their perception. Yani, there are universities that are adopting the book as a reader, okay, in various classes. The students are seeing beyond this barrier of these are refugees, especially now, I think something like that would have an impact for people to break their fears and their negative expectations. We discovered that some of those refugees are, one of them was a doctor, okay? One of them told us, what do you know about the Sudan? And we kind of said, uh, it's down south, <laughs> okay? And he pulled out a map from his pocket and he laid it out on the ground and we slid off our seats and sat on our knees around him and he described the Sudan. He described the geography, the history, the culture, the art and we were like, wow, you know, like he made it, we understood the conflict, we understood a lot of things and he, ha he was so knowledgeable, okay. One of the refugees was a student in university, one of them was a mother of four and her father owned large acres of land and he, he was devoting part of that land for charity. Yani yeah, their stories, the, we think of them, or normally refugees are thought of as being very poor, uneducated, whatever. That's not true. Okay? And in, at the beginning of the book we put this uh, quotation from one of them which said, I, I could be your brother, your father, your sister, your mother, I could be you, okay? So uh, that's the service. We got that voice communicated to a wide readership. Anyway, I'm talking about reflection, <laughs> okay? And this is something I learned through this girl's reflection. And I was able to support her to best advance her learning while not losing the community-based experience although I changed the context for her, so it's okay. I'm sorry, Ahmed. I just want to mention something about mm -hmm. refugees. The term is very new. 
there has not, not been refugees until recently after the uh, post-colonial era mm -hmm. where, where every, all the borders were determined clearly by other states. Yes. And other than that, they were all migrants. So yeah. everybody had the right to move on this earth from A to B, and they choose to live in a different community, yeah. but not to be called on as refugees. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, that's also something we could have discussed. We didn't, but it's, it's a great thing to bring in history, to bring in linguistics, to bring in cultural attitudes. It gives you a lot of richness to work with. Okay, so to uh, assess the experience, we have these reflection tools that I'll get into more detail on. And then we also have what the CLT offers in terms of what they call the SGIDs small group instructional diagnosis. I'm not sure if you've ever um, uh, got the CLT to work with you on this. Uh, they come to your class, okay, you step out, I don't know why, but they, they ask you to step out, and then they work with small groups to help them express what they want. Well, you're out so that if they want to say something that they don't want you to hear, they have that freedom, okay? But they cultivate all of that experience. They have prompt questions that get the students to really think about what they're doing. How does it impact their learning? How does it impact them as people? Remember at the beginning in the definition from Campus Compact, we had there is academic learning, there is personal growth, and there is civic engagement. You know, who am I in the middle of this community? There's the civic identity questions. There is commitment to service. There is knowledge of the broader social and community issues. Okay? What's the R stands for? Instructional. Small group instructional diagnosis. It's a kind of assessment carried out by the Center for Learning and Teaching. And then, how do you measure the learning? Well, it's as you would in any other class that does not employ community-based learning methods. Remember, it's a method. Okay, but it's a method that has a lot of benefit. It's not a goal in itself, but definitely it brings a lot of richness and benefit to uh, your class. And it can be a parallel goal. It can be. It can be that you are doing this both to teach the students and to enrich the community. Okay, so you do it through any of the tools you already use for assessing learning. Okay, usually essay type, project type, uh, reports, proposals, proposals for, uh, you know, uh, advancement of a certain project in the community or whatever, presentations, all of these things will serve as assessments of learning. So, through reflection, I'm going to focus on this particular tool called reflection. Through reflection, the students articulate their learning outcomes. What is it that I'm learning? Okay, what is it that I'm supposed to learn? Okay, they may analyze concepts, they evaluate experiences, form opinions, support those opinions with evidence that is community-based or research-based, derive new meaning and new knowledge, and set goals for the transfer of learning. So let me put these in the form of a model. There are various models that we use, and I've played with various ones, okay, to help the students go through a meaningful structured reflection. Okay, it's not just think about your thinking or think about your learning. No, you give them guidelines to work with. And the one that is easiest for me to use, and most teachers use it, but it's not the only one. Remember, it's a model. It's not the way, okay? is Kolb's, David Kolb's experiential learning cycle. David Kolb is an educator psychologist, okay, and he created the experiential learning model. It begins with the concrete experience, so this is maybe the community-based experience, okay, and then you move to reflective observations. You're making your observations, you're describing what you saw, you're describing your learning, you're describing the impact it has on you. And then you derive or you abstract 
conceptualizations. You tie it to theory that you're reading in class, okay? You make inferences and generalizations. You compare to another experience. You, it takes you up a level in the... Uh, it takes you up in higher order thinking levels. Okay, so you begin with description and then you are an analyzing. There's a lot of analysis, there's a lot of comparison, there's a lot of definition and analyzing definitions. There's a lot of contrast, there's a lot of categorization. Okay. And then you experiment with these new concepts. Well, what do I do with this learning? Now, David Kolb's uh, terms may not be very easy for students to understand. So I found a much easier representation of the same model, okay, which just says, do it, that's the experience, and then you ask, what happened? Okay, so just what? So this is where you describe the experience, you describe the academic learning, you describe the personal growth, you describe the civic engagement. So you answer the question, what? And then you answer the question, so what? What does it mean? Okay, this is where you're analyzing and you're comparing and you're uh, applying theory or you're critiquing theory. Okay, because you've, you, you've read something and then you've seen here's a case study on the ground. How does it align with this theory? So this is all the academic work happens here, the more complex kinds of uh, work. And then you ask the question, now what? How will I do this differently next time? So you're setting goals. In other words, you're making recommendations. Okay? You are uh, um, articulating what the limitations were, what further areas for research and further areas for service might be. Okay? So it's the, the experience and then what? So what? Then what? And it's still David Kolb's experiential learning model, okay, but in very much simpler uh, language. Any questions about this? So I give them an assignment, okay, and maybe the assignment takes them through all the four stages. You've gone through the experience, now describe, then analyze, then set goals. Or I give them different kinds of t reflective tools, at some point they're only describing and description is, I think description is a higher order skill because they need to uh, select detail. They need to have a rationale for why they're selecting these particular areas to describe. Okay? Maybe I give them another assignment which is a more complex analysis paper. So I'm only focusing on that particular third stage. It doesn't all have to come in the same assignment. Maybe it's written reflection, but maybe it's discussion. And you still, in your mind, you're channeling the discussion to make sure that they're not just describing what happened and complaining and whatever, but you're getting them to think about, well, how does this connect with the more general concepts that we are discussing? Okay? How would you define it differently? How would you do it differently? What would you propose for this? What is your argument? for this. So you're, go, you're helping them go through these higher, more complex levels of thinking and analysis and application and argument and persuasion and creative uh, uh, problem solving. Okay? This is another model. Okay? Patty Clayton is uh, somebody who's been working forever in community-based learning and she's also developed something uh, that she calls the deal model, which is pretty m similar to David Kolb, but it's a different one and it's also popular in the literature. If you search for assessment models for service learning, the deal model will come up. And deal star, uh, stands for describe, examine, D-E-A-L, describe, examine, and again you examine what? You examine all these different vectors that come in, the academic, the personal, the civic. Okay? Or one of them, or two of them. You select what you want to do. So describe, examine, and articulate the learning. In other words, articulate your goals also. So it becomes deal. 
And she's also put it in a... Um, yeah. I'm just reflecting on the reflections <laughs> that I give my students. Yeah. Uh, and I realize that, probably because I haven't done it uh, from a pedagogical perspective, that... Does anyone... Um, I'm mixing and matching. Is there any kind of... I mean, like, that no. sometimes my uh, prompt for the students would be to reflect on only the academic, but other times it would be to yes. reflect and articulate, and other times it would be to... Does it matter? No, it does no. not. Okay. No, these are, as I was saying, these are just... Yeah, I mean, tools for scaffolding the reflection. Yeah, but I was wondering if there's, I mean, if there's sort of arguments for having them as distinct section or, no. or distinctly identified. Or what not. we don't want to happen is for teachers to get stuck on getting students only to describe what happened, repeat, you know, without engaging them in real critical thinking. Okay. So the, these models help you recognize where it is that the students... I mean, initially when I was giving reflection essays, what were the students writing? This was a terrific experience. This class is really nice. Oh, I love the community. Oh, shut up. Okay? Because it doesn't say anything. But having a model for you as a teacher at the back of your head guides you to how can I construct the reflection prompt so that it does elicit more complex kinds of thinking and more critical types of writing, rather than very superficial, this is what the teacher wants to hear, you're doing great, mm -hmm. okay? And let me also uh, bring this uh, point. Mona and I <laughs> have had the experience that when students are really engaged and they do recognize the value of what they're doing, and they do recognize what it means, okay? And uh, they are able to critically analyze and to evaluate and whatever. Sometimes I've had worse student evaluations, not better, okay? Because the students want more, okay? The students recognize that they've done something, but there's so much more, okay? And they're, they're, they, sometimes they're even more critical. But may, that's... May interrupt? Yeah. Don't ever say student evaluation. Mm. In, no, but I'm just... Student feedback. Let's... <laughs> Good. Yeah. So that's a, yeah, that's it is a nice really, way. Yeah, well, nice it hurts stuff. my... All the time when I feel <laughs> this stuff. Right? That's yeah. actually... But that is so Sorry for simple being, but uh, so profound. We should really... Student feedback. Being, How nice. Yeah, but we should really... That might make all the difference to them filling it out. I mean, we should really suggest that the university does that. Yes. Most of my Honestly, students such do not know to evaluate themselves, let alone to evaluate someone else, let alone to evaluate the process. Student feedback. No, but but I'm, what I'm... It from the perspective of feedback, I mean, if we just change that word, it might yes. really completely change the way they approach I agree. it. And what they, well, I, I agree. I agree. It's well, such a simple so difference. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, I, I'm just saying uh, I know what, that. Sorry yeah. for the interruption. Yeah. I did not. No, no. But what I'm saying is that you equip them, okay, to engage in this kind of more complex thinking, and they're able to. And even though they're writing this, it really tells. It shows what you're doing, and it shows how deep the learning has become. And here's a third model. So we've shared David Kolb's experiential learning cycle, the deal model for Patty Clayton, even though I didn't show you the graphic, it's in that link, you will have access to it. It's, it's almost the same. It's, it's almost just, the same. Um, but I, I'm just sharing it because there's so much yeah, about the yeah. deal model in the literature. And there's more. There, I just selected three. This is not one that's in the literature, okay. Okay, but it's one that I've used because I learned about it and it works nicely sometimes. Again, I, you play. Okay, you see what works for the particular purpose of the lesson. Ken Wilber's, I think I've misspelled Wilber, it's B-E-R. Ken Wilber's integral model. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And Ken Wilber divides experience or reality into four quadrants. Okay? Along two axes. Again, one axis is the individual and the collective. Individual, 
collective. And the horizontal axis is the interior exterior. So then the four quadrants are the individual interior, the individual exterior, the collective interior and the collective exterior. When you're talking about the individual interior, you're focused on the self. You're focused on, you know, how, how has this impacted me? What kinds of assumptions did I have beforehand? What have I discovered about myself? Okay? Uh, what kinds of motivations do I have for this kind of experience? Would I do this again? It's focused on the individual interior. The individual exterior is what's in the surrounding, the environment. The environment was a garbage dump. The environment was, uh, so if I'm working in a school, okay, the structure of the school, uh, how the classes are functioning, you know, that kind of thing. It's an external environment. But it's a more you... physical or more tangible mm. thing. But okay? in terms of the reflection, what would you be asking the students to do if they were focusing yeah, on Yeah, to, to describe the oh, environment. Okay. Okay. But not necessarily to link the environment to themselves. Like not necessarily to say... Yeah, I mean, oh, you can, you okay. can. I mean, it depends what you want. Okay. okay. The exterior, the individual exterior is more about space. It's more about visible behaviors. Mm -hmm. It's empirical in the sense that you can measure it not in some form. Concept. It's not abstract. You can measure it. Okay. <coughs> the collective interior is about the community, it's the shared meanings, it's the shared values, it's the traditions, it's cultural behaviors, it's gender typing, okay? So all of these community beliefs and community assumptions and community, it's these shared, also abstract, but within the collective. The collective exter exterior is the systems that govern the collective. Okay, so what's the health system? What's the legal system? What's the educational system? The policies, the laws. Okay, so these are the systems that govern the collective behavior. Okay, so sometimes I will have the students understand this and then focus specifically, depending on the purpose of my class, okay, if I'm more concerned with their, you know, spiritual connections or their emotional uh, reactions or whatever, I'll focus on the upper left, okay? And if I'm focused more on, you know, if it's a political science class and I want to focus on the, the legal structure, the how do I work f to advocate X or whatever, depending on my purpose, I may select a different quadrant. Again, you don't have to use this model or the other. You select or you create your own. The model is not the goal. It's just a, a, a tool, okay? And as I was saying, reflection activities could be written, they could be oral, they could be graphic design. So they're, they're designing something, but in the design, they are reflecting a message. The message that raises awareness about an issue, for example, okay? So it could be in any medium but your goals are the same. You're having them deal with concepts, analyze, set goals, whatever. Well, of course, you can use two or three media together, multiple media, okay? So it could be written, oral, visual, audio, kinesthetic, digital, whatever, okay? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can express a, a, a community a issue through a dance that I've lost autonomy, that I'm restricted, whatever, so the dance is mm. not freely flowing. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yeah, tips, just a little tips. We're coming to a closure, inshallah. For so some tips for implementation. If you're starting, start small. Mm -hmm. Don't get overexcited, okay? Because there's a lot of learning. There's immense richness in the experience, not just for the student, not just for the community, but for you as a teacher. And the, uh, the session that we're having after the general faculty meeting will be very much about the teacher. How do you support the teacher? How do you help the teacher grow? 
Okay, what kinds of challenges does, does the teacher face? What do you do about it? Okay, start small, okay? Uh, small in size, small in number of projects. I mean, there are some faculty members who have CBL in all three of their classes. Well, they need to be on solid ground to do that. And they need to have the time to coordinate all the, the logistics and the phone calls from a student or the phone call from Misharif Neen. You know, you have to be uh, on solid ground. Use institutional resources. So if, you, if there's somebody you can learn from, uh, write an email, call them up, meet with them. Okay, if there's something you can read in the library, if you can work with an organization on campus. So for example, one of the examples I gave in the previous slide was case studies. If I'm teaching my students case studies and I want to make it community-based, maybe I can partner with the case study center here, the Hisham Khazandar Center in Business. They do, case, they need case studies of different corporate organizations that have a social responsibility mission. Allah. If, I'm, if my writing class is about writing case studies, why don't I partner with them? They will be my partner, okay? And I will get the students to do, write their case studies for them. Okay, so I'm using institutional resources in terms of learning resources, in terms of service resources. I learn more about the campus and what the campus can help with and what I can give back to the campus and then beyond. Okay, so one of the examples which I could have put up, I should have put up, uh, is an example of a class that teaches, it's a linguistics class, it teaches principles of teaching. So the students in the class are learning how to teach English. Okay, so what have they done? They've looked at, well, who can be my immediate community partner? Let's do it on campus. So they're teaching the workers. Because the workers are here every day, they walk amongst us, they hear us, they can't understand anything. They see all these flyers and banners, they can't read them. It's, it's weird, you know, to be on, in a space that you, you can't understand, okay? A faculty member starts yelling at them, they don't understand, okay? So the, the class, the community-based learning project for the class is to, to teach English to the AUC workers. They're using institutional resources to support their learning and their service goes back to support the institutional uh, community. Involving or talking to other faculty, you learn a great deal by just talking to that. What are you doing in your class? You know, how's, it, how's it working for you? Okay. Have you had the experience of Musharifi? You know, that kind of thing. I do that all the time. Fostering interdisciplinary partnerships yeah, so maybe I'm a digital rhetoric class, but I'm working with a class in labor economics and I'm helping them develop a web page for X. I've partnered with the class, okay? Maybe they're doing something to inform my digital rhetoric as well because they're giving me content, they're giving me the theories, they want all of this to be, to, to be put online. So the students are working together, but they have this shared project. Determining learning goals before implementing. You need to know the path, but recognize that the goals are the same. How to get there, you have a plan, you might have to kind of diverge a little bit and come back. It's not going to be fixed in stone, but your learning goals are clear to you. You don't want to go off and continue off. <laughs> okay, you need to come back. <laughs> Models of organizing the class, okay? So, yeah. So my example of the students working on a book, that's an example of an entire class working on one CBL activity. Each doing, or each group doing, part of it. So the whole activity is the book, okay? But each couple of students are working on a chapter in the book. That's one class working on one activity. In Mona's classes, I think you have the students, for example, write a needs assessment. It's a full report. But different student groups or pairs or individuals are working on different sections. And then they put it together into a one project. Okay? The class is divided into groups. So for example, in my grant writing class, I've had an experience where 
the, we're all working on one project for one NGO, but I've also had, uh, I've managed it differently, where I had different student groups. Each group is working on a different project, either for the same organization, or a different project, each group with a different organization. Okay? So maybe Stabla Antar, Tawasul organization, they need the sewage system, they also need a water system, they also need roofing, and I have three groups, and each group is developing a particular project for the same organization, okay, but different project. Or, for example, I had one group working with the cancer hospital, the children's cancer hospital, another children working with a, uh, an autism center, a third group working with a disability uh, integration center, Okay, and a fourth group working with the same disability center, but rather than developing a program to empower the disabled child, they're developing a program for parents' preparation. Okay, so it depends how you want to do your, uh, how you want to structure your class. And then also there are some classes which give the students, for example, a list of NGO partners, and they say, select one to work with. And then the student goes to the NGO, they speak to the people, and they give them certain work hours. It's like an internship. Okay? But they're really doing a certain... Yani they have to do a project or tasks. It doesn't have to be a project. Individual tasks. They give a service, but they also support the learning outcomes of the class. So you as an instructor, you have to work with the student to ensure that whatever the activity, it is forwarding the learning outcomes of the class. It's not an activity that is community service. It is definitely CBL. You have to ensure that. Okay, but when I say start small, in the previous slide, you don't want to have 18 students, each one in a different organization, and you have to be in constant, constant communication with these different host organizations. You'll go crazy. At least I would. Okay? So you want to make sure that it's manageable for you so that you can enjoy the teaching as well. Okay? The ethics. And I've spoken about ethics briefly when I said ethical exit with closure. But there's also ethical entrance. And the ethical entrance has to do with adequate preparation of both parties, the students and the class and myself, the teacher, and also adequate preparation of uh, the community so that there's ethical entrance. You're building trust. They know who you are. You know, they know why you're there. They know you're not there to just collect information. Okay, you form the partnership then there's ethical exit, exit of the community, with closure, okay? Can I just add one there? Yeah. One question, uh, there's no time for it. Lala, go ahead. Uh, the sense of ownership, mm -hmm. whatever we're trying to do with them, they, we have to always make sure that they feel they own this outcome. And it's not, uh, it's theirs. Yes. Uh, uh, ownership, where is it? If you ownership, Hina? Involvement of community in planning and decision taking. Yes, so in, in other words, <coughs> sense of ownership. Yes. So this is something that we easily forget and, yeah. and just feel that, oh, this is good for my mm -hmm. TV or my yes. portfolio. Or if they don't have ownership, it'll sit there and they will not make use of it. You're right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, like all these mega projects that yes. uh, <laughs> organizations do and they just sit there because people don't have ownership. Yes. Commitment to service, if you commit to working with a community, you'd better be there when you say you are going to be there. You'd better fulfill the task. You don't want to be sloppy. I mean, I'm talking about the students, yeah? So the students need to learn what the ethics are of working with the community. If they're doing research, they also need to go through IRB. Okay, the Institutional Review Board. Uh, that's a different kind of... <laughs> Uh, presentation, but uh, IRB is for people who are doing research with human subjects. Okay, they need to ensure that the people know they are informed and they give their consent to what you're doing. They approve it. So there is informed consent. Uh, 
called IRB. IRB. Informed. Informed consent. Okay, I can give you the link to the IRB page so that you check it out if you're going to be doing research in the community. Research that you're going to publish. Okay? You want to make sure you do this process before you enter the community. It's for the ethical standards and protection of your human participants. Okay, so informed consent. No, Institutional Review Board. IRB is Institutional Review Board. Okay? You want to make sure that uh, you preserve their confidentiality, their anonymity if they choose so. Okay? You want to make sure that you're not putting any group in harm's way. Okay? You're minimizing risk. You're protecting the vulnerable groups, so if you're working with refugees or prisoners or disabled uh, people with uh, special needs or if you're working with pregnant women or whatever, you want to make sure that you're not putting them at risk. You're protecting their rights and their wellness. Okay? So the IRB process is an application that you fill out describing your research. It goes through a committee. They have to approve it to make sure that you are following these ethical standards. And then they give you permission to do the research in the community. Okay? Can you give an example of this institution? Uh, it's, it's in campus. It's a committee on campus. It's a committee of faculty. In Egypt, or in, I, I, I in Egypt ba, it's, you have to have another, if you're going beyond the campus and you're, you want to do it right, you have to go through TAPMAS. <laughs> yeah. Uh, center for, uh, uh, that's the M. And statistics. That's yeah. MAS. <laughs> yeah. Central Public, uh, and Mobilization Yes. Central Authority for Public mobilization and statistics, CAPMAS, and I believe the departments, if you are in a department that normally works with communities off campus, they have a letter of agreement, sometimes, <laughs> okay, with the, <laughs> with the community. If not, then there is an email and an office on campus that will help you with this procedure also. So maybe I can refer you at the end of the session. This, this paper, I use it when I go to the community uh, NGO or the community member, key members, and I present this paper? No, but you, you present yourself and what you want to do, and you, you make sure that they, you inform them, you get their informed approval of what you are doing, okay? You want to show them how it is that they are not being harmed in any way, mm -hmm. okay? And then you abide by everything that the letter that IRB tells you.